I want to go ahead and welcome everyone today to our webinar on tripling your cash flow with Airbnb. My name is Lisa Rodriguez and I am the Director of Retail National Accounts here at Newview Trust. Uh, we'd first like to start off by, by saying that we are not attorneys or CPAs. We are not uh, financial advisors. We are a non-fiduciary. So all of the information and materials that are presented today are strictly for educational purposes. Uh, we do encourage you to consult with your advisors, accountants, attorneys um, before entering into any type of investment and doing your due diligence. Where does Newview fit in? Uh, we custody IRAs for clients that want choice, that want alternative investments rather than just in the stock market. Uh, we've been in business for 17 years. We have almost 50 qualified administrators here in the Longwood, Florida area. And we currently custody 1.4 billion in assets. And we pride ourselves on making our business simple and making ourselves available and being responsive to your needs. Um, so much so that every Monday in our staff meeting, we talk about the phones and how many calls were answered by a live person and we keep track of that. And so again, um, we try to make it as simple and, and be as available to our clients as possible. Today, we are going to have a guest, Kyle Stanley. He's a real estate and Air, Airbnb professional in Fresno, California. Um, in just 16 months, Kyle accumulated 22 Airbnb listings and this business gives Kyle the freedom to live on his terms, travel and focus on the important things. So Kyle is also passionate about teaching others how to build an Airbnb portfolio like he has. And so without further ado, here's Kyle Stanley. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. And uh, if you're seeing me, um, I'm in an Airbnb in Arizona right now. We're actually expanding our business over here. So really, really excited about what's going on right now. But I'm excited to give everyone just a, uh, a look into the Airbnb business model. I think it's becoming one of those things that like everyone is starting to hear more about and they're asking questions. And I know for me, like as soon as I started talking about this on my podcast and YouTube channel, it was just like, everyone was like, tell me more about Airbnb. And so um, I'm excited to bring you a little bit more information about that today. And I want to start off by sharing a little bit more about me and also uh, my story. So this is my sixth year of Airbnb, but as Lisa mentioned in just under basically about 16 to 18 months, we've accumulated 22 properties. And, and the reason for that, just so you know a little bit more about me and what brought me to Airbnb, uh, I started in Arizona when I lived here, um, was doing it as what we call a house hacking uh, method where basically you was just renting a room out of my own house. It was helping me to pay for my mortgage. That's all I ever saw with Airbnb. I just thought it was a great way to be able to help you pay for your mortgage and meet cool people as they were, you know, able to rent a room from you at a night at a time or as much as, you know, six months at a time. And then when I moved back to Fresno because my dad got ill, um, I just assumed, well, who in the world is going to want to come to Fresno, California? So I just didn't do Airbnb for about the first couple months. And then one day I just said, you know, what the heck, why not try this? And the, as soon as I threw it up on Airbnb, just a room out of my house again, uh, we got booked. And I was like, why are you coming to Fresno, California? If you know anything about Fresno, it's, it's not the most like attractive place to, to be for like a vacation. And that's all I ever thought about these things was vacation, right? But in my now, like I said, just over 18 months of doing this in Fresno, what I've found is that there is a need because people are um, looking at Airbnb as a better way to travel. And so um, I'm going to get into a lot of that here in a bit, but just long story short, uh, I started to get into real estate investing, flipping houses. And I kind of looked back and said, well, this Airbnb thing is kind of real estate investing, I guess. And why not try my entire house? And in one weekend, I made $450 just running out my entire house while on a vacation. And that felt like freedom to me. That felt like, wow, this vacation I just went on, it's basically paid because I rented out my house for an entire weekend on Airbnb. And it opened up the, the floodgates to me learning more about this and getting into all the ways of which I could be an Airbnb host. And now today, as uh, mentioned, 22 listings um, on Airbnb gives me incredible cash flow. It's not a passive business, but it's about as passive as possible if you set up the right systems. And then um, there you go. I mean, each of those listings is on average getting us just about $1,000 a month. 
And so today, what I really want to be able to share with you is, and, and help you answer these questions so that you can know, is Airbnb worth it either A, as a business for me, or is it worth it for maybe one of my current rental properties or a future rental property? Maybe you're thinking about doing this one at a time and, and is it worth it to do this versus maybe a regular rental? And that's the whole name of this today, right? Triple your income with Airbnb. That is the goal is to help you see a way to be able to triple at least triple your cash flow with Airbnb. So the first thing is, is it worth all the management? That's gonna be one of the questions that I answer today. Um, another one I get a lot is, you know, is it worth it to invest all of the furniture? Uh, these are common questions that I get all the time, guys. I talk to students of mine and people who are interested in getting into Airbnb, and these are all the common questions that have been compiled. Um, you're gonna get a chance to answer, ask some questions as well at the end here. Um, so make sure that you're writing down your questions in the Q&A and I will definitely be getting to them at the end. But um, don't I have to change the sheets and clean the place all the time? Like the turnover just sounds so intimidating. That's always one I get. Uh, what if my place gets trashed or worse? You know, like what if it gets set on fire? What if people steal stuff? That's a scary thought, right? What kind of uh, return on my investment will I get? And um, how do I know if my area is even good for Airbnb? Like after today, if I see everything Kyle talks about and I'm set to do this, how do I really know um, if I would actually make money in my backyard? So um, let's get to it. The problem and the opportunity. So the problem is really, it is $200 to $400 of cash flow at a rental property enough for you. When you think about all the things that come with owning a property and what we call CapEx, capital expenses, is $200 to $400 a month of cash flow going to help me earn a return on my investment that's going to get me to my type of lifestyle that I want quick enough? So that might be a yes, that might be a no for you. Either way, that does arise as the issue is, is that enough? If it's not enough, we're gonna show you a way to be able to do it today. Um, the other problem, hotels, they're crowded. So from a guest standpoint, hotels are very crowded and people are kind of starting to get irritated of the whole, whole hotel type of feel. Uh, they really want to feel at home. They want to have the living room. They want to have the kitchen. They want to be able to do laundry, um, especially these traveling professionals or people that are coming in with their families and have six, seven, eight people, you know, staying a week at a place, they want to be able to have that at home feel. Common reasons for the stay, again, business professionals, employees, uh, we get a lot of that for sure. Uh, family visiting family or the, the travelers, the vacationers. And there's different types of markets that will have heavy on employees and there's other ones that have heavy on travelers and vacationers. We're going to talk about the difference of those in a bit. And it's the cool thing to do. Like, you know, now today saying like, oh yeah, I'm running out an Airbnb. You're kind of like bragging about it to your friends, right? Like even as I'm getting on here, I'm telling Lisa and Grace like, hey, I'm at an Airbnb. I'm, <laughs> I love staying in Airbnbs. And I've got my dogs with me. Apologize if you hear my dogs barking in the background. Joy's working from home right now. Um, so our business performance, a little look into my business over the last 12 months, an average occupancy of 96% really high. That's, if you don't know, that's pretty phenomenal. Um, an average rate of $122. The average rate in Fresno itself is about 107, 108. So we are outperforming um, our competition. And that makes an average gross rent per property of $3,500, just over $3,500, which means that the average expense per property um, given with uh, your mortgage, your um, electrical bill, your utilities, your landscape. Because again, guys, this is something that you have to pay for instead of a regular rental where the other tenant pays for it. And that's one of the reasons why people think, oh, Airbnb isn't as profitable because I'm having to pay for all those things. Well, let's look at the difference. An average net of $1,163 per property um, and that's per property owned. So just to make sure you understand that we're talking about owning properties today. There's other methods of Airbnb that are also very profitable that do not include owning a property, but we're not going to get into that today. So let's do a case study. This is an actual property that I own. And if I had done a traditional rental on this, so it's a three bedroom, two bath, 1,380 square feet. It's in a great location in Fresno, next to Fresno State. A lot of good things happening over there. A lot of people would want to stay there or live there. Um, purchase price was two twenty. I put a down payment of forty five thousand dollars. That's twenty percent, and I could rent this thing out 
for right around fifteen hundred dollars. Maybe, maybe if I got a really desperate renter, I could get sixteen to seventeen hundred. But that's meaning that after a mortgage of thirteen ten, I'm netting just about two hundred dollars, just under it. What does that give me in terms of a yearly cash flow? Just under twenty three hundred dollars. That's assuming I have zero expenses. The roof stays intact. The plumbing's fine. I don't have to send a maintenance man to have anything. That's assuming a lot, right? Because there's going to be issues. But even if everything goes smoothly, my return on my investment is 5.1% and it takes me 20 years to earn my investment back. Now, obviously you're listening to this and you're saying, well, I love real estate and it's not just because of the cash flow. I love it because of the appreciation. I love the tenants paying down the debt. I love the, um, the fact that I get um, tax advantages. There's so many different things that are great about real estate versus the cash flow. But Airbnb is amazing for cash flow. So let's take this same case study as an Airbnb short term rental. Again, these are real numbers from my property. Um, purchase price, we've already gone through all that. Now, we have actually um, expenses that include furnishing and our amenities that I'm being conservative on. I, I, I think it was more around like 13 or 14,000, but for this, we're going 55,000. Total rent, about 3,000 dollars per month, averaging about 100 to 120 dollars per night. Total expenses 1700, net profit 1300. Guys, you remember what the net profit was on the other one? The net profit on the other was right around 200 dollars. Our total expenses were only our mortgage, which was 1310, but on this one we have 390 dollars of more expenses, but we still have almost, this is what, multiplying that net profit by six or seven. So I told you triple, but I'm showing you six or seven times the profit. Yearly cash flow is $15,600. Return on investment, 28.4%. It takes three and a half years to earn my investment back as compared to a regular rental where it's going to take 20. And that's assuming that there's no issues with the house. Um, so if that doesn't fire you up, I'm sorry, the rest of my presentation will not fire you up. Uh, so here we go, how it works. You gotta acquire a property, right? You gotta get one, you gotta have control of a property. Then you gotta furnish the property and equip it with all amenities. Big question I always get is, what, what are examples of amenities? Well, you gotta, gotta have enough sheets and comforters for all the beds. You gotta have um, enough dish soap and laundry detergent. And I love putting ring doorbells on the front of my house. I put that in the amenities. Um, I would say any of the cooking ware, the utensils, uh, the towels, the um, anything that would, if you think about it, if you live in your house and you want access to something that will help you to be able to live in your home and not have to go to the store to go get, then you want that in your Airbnb. And so, that is what the amenities um, end up being. I, I know a lot of people that when I start to manage their Airbnbs, they are missing a ton of amenities. And because they just assume that, oh, wait, I've never really gotten a bad review about it, so I should be fine. Well, then that one guest comes in and they're like, what the heck? Why do we have no cooking pots or pans? Like the whole reason I got an Airbnb was because it has a kitchen. So you have to think about it from a guest standpoint of what they would need. You list the property on Airbnb. Now, there's other sites, VRBO, booking.com. Um, there is home away. There's so many different ones, but I'm only talking about Airbnb today. Um, name your price and control your calendar of availability. So this is a big question that I always get is, well, how do I know what to price it? Or am I allowed to price it? Whatever I want. You are allowed to price it whatever in the world you want. I see properties in Fresno that are priced at $300 a night and some that are priced at $50 a night. It depends on what you think your property is valued at. And then if you're getting booked out regularly, then you know, you're at a good price. Um, if you go out of town and you don't want to deal with it, block off your calendar. If you are wanting to live in it for two weeks, block off your calendar. You get to control everything. It's pretty awesome. Uh, respond to guests and provide a great hospitality experience. So this is a big thing. Yes, we're talking about real estate returns on investment, but we are in a hospitality industry when we go into Airbnb. We cannot just list the place and assume that the guest is always going to know everything about it and that they're going to be fine and they're going to check in and check out. We never have to talk to them. You're going to have to talk to guests because there's going to be things that are missing, damaged, broken, not working, 
you know, hot water heater went out, the, the shower is cold, you know, things like that. You've got to be able to be in a position to create a great experience. And so that comes with a lot of different systems and ways of doing it. So let, let's look at what a good example of one of my listings is. If we can bring that up. Let's see, I know. And if, if we can't, no big deal. There we go. Okay. So this is one of my listings. First of all, the number one thing that I want to point out, if you can see this 4.93 star rating, and that's with 85 reviews. All right. Overall, if we go to my profile, which I'm not going to go right now, we have a 4.89 star rating over six years. Um, pretty phenomenal. Very, very proud of that. But a lot of it is because of the way of which we promote and market our properties and then the, the experience that we give our guests. So title, gorgeous house, five minutes from Fresno State and airport. Already someone knows that it's a house, it's close to Fresno State and it's close to the airport. So if I'm looking at a calendar or a, a map of all the Airbnbs and I see that title and I know that I'm flying in, I know that this would be a good opportunity to be able to be close to the airport. And so let's see what the house looks like. Is it nice? Is it up to date? What, do I, what am I looking at? And by the way, this is the case study that I showed you, uh, the three bedroom, two bath, 300, uh, 1,380 square feet. And so the one thing I want to point out is just it's modern furniture. It looks nice. It looks clean. We've got our desk over here for workers. That's one big thing. Um, and it's clean. So we, we painted the cabinets. The, the countertops are nothing special. It's nothing sexy. It's just basic countertops. Now this works for Fresno. If I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, which we're looking at over here, we're going to have to be a lot more updated with things. So we're going to probably put more time and more um, money into updating the house. Whereas in Fresno, I can get away with, you know, a little bit less nice things because the reason people are coming is for a completely different reason. So um, nice bathroom every and by the way if you're noticing these are professional pictures aside from this we'll take a picture every once in a while to show amenities like this is pretty cool we've got a usb outlet just to show that we're a little bit different we show hey what are you close to five minutes from this three minutes from that uh these are little things that i add into but professional pictures these are not cell phone pictures these are not rinky dink pictures they're professional so that's the big thing there and then your description is a big thing as well making sure that you're describing the property very, very well. And then one of the things that we always ask our guests to do, if you'll notice down here, by the way, they can look at all the reviews, everything that people are saying about it. You can see location, but at the bottom here, it's very important that you have all of your um, house rules listed out and, and understanding. And this, this will help you guys. This is a great tip that I'm about to give you. If you're going to get an Airbnb, and you want to avoid parties, all you have to do is this. You have to put in your house rules, no partying of any kind. Make sure that you understand that our neighbors know that there's no partying and they will call the cops on you. There's a noise ordinance. We don't want to get fined. We don't want to have to kick you out. And so when a guest requests to stay at your house, you're not going to assume that they've read the house rules. You're going to message them and you're going to say, hey, have you read the house rules? Two things. We have a no party policy. Make sure you see that. And we also have a recording device at the front of the property. So that's for your safety and our security. You will completely, uh, not completely, but you will find that your, your rate of which you have problems in your Airbnbs from theft to damage to parties to loud noise will go down dramatically if you just follow that system of putting it in your house rules and then requiring the guests to confirm that they agree to the house rules as well. Okay. So, um, and then of course, you know, you've got all your pricing over here and the dating and availability and everything. We're going at 135 a night right now for this one because we've built up the price on this. Um, so even more of a return on investment. Pretty awesome. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint now. If we can do that. We've got about 10 minutes left here. So I'm going to get as much information in as I can before we get to the Q&A. So one of the biggest questions is, does location matter? Um, so first of all, yes, it does, but most places will work. So don't overanalyze too much, but here's some tips 
about location. First of all, do your research, contact your city. There are cities like Nashville and Vegas that I would absolutely stay out of uh, because those are places that are, they have very large regulations on Airbnbs uh, unless it's your primary residence. So that's a big thing. Secondly, uh, research rates on AirDNA. Uh, AirDNA is an amazing website. It's like the MLS of Airbnb. So you can see literally down the street, what is a three bedroom, two bath going for in this area? How does it look? Is it nice as mine is gonna look? Okay, great, this is a great comp. They're getting about 180 a night, I can get 180 a night. So that's exactly what you can do by becoming a member of AirDNA. It's uh, a monthly membership uh, based on your location. Um, and I would just do it for a month and then you can cancel after that. Um, download our profit calculator. So here's the deal, you, you learn what you can make on it, but you need to know all of the numbers. And so if you go to my website, fearlesskyle.com, you wanna write that down, go to it after this presentation, um, right there on the home website, you can download our Airbnb profit calculator. It'll show you exactly how to be able to use it. And uh, you just plug in the numbers and see what you would make. It's pretty awesome. Um, so let's get you a few tips before we're wrapping up here. Start with your strengths. And what do I mean by start with your strengths? So if your strength is the numbers and analyzing deals and um, understanding how to be able to compare properties to each other, but maybe you're more of an introvert and you don't like talking to guests, you don't like dealing with people, you don't like messaging back and forth with them. Well, maybe you want to outsource that. Maybe you want to partner with someone who's good at that. Do the things that you really love. The reason I love this business is not because I was meant to be in the hospitality business and I was meant to run properties. I love this business because I get to focus on all my strengths while outsourcing the things I don't like. Guys, I'll be really honest. I don't like dealing with guests. I think most people, when it comes down to it, um, ask for help before they actually need help and they don't try to go and figure things out on their own. And then for that reason, I get really irritated. I'm like, dude, just go figure it out. You can, you can find out how to turn on the hot water in the house. <laughs> so I get this like moments of, oh, I just don't want to deal with the guests. So what did I do? I outsourced it. I hired virtual assistants. I hired an in-person assistant if we ever needed to go to the house and you know bring something to the, the guests. So I've completely taken my hand off of that or my foot off that gas pedal and I outsource that. So that would be the big thing. Start with your strengths. Um, always pick a safe neighborhood. That is a non-negotiable. Do not pick any neighborhoods in your area or in any area that a guest would show up and wonder, am I going to get shot? Very simple. Uh, worst neighborhood we're in is about a B, B minus neighborhood. Set up your systems. What kind of systems? Well, there's check-in, check-out, communication, cleaning, setup, all these different things from getting the Airbnb ready to getting ready for the first guest to actually giving that guest an experience to getting them out with minimal cleaning to have to do for your cleaning crew to getting your cleaning crew in at the right time so that the next guest can check in five hours later to making sure that that guest gives you a five-star review to making sure that they're a repeat customer. There's so many different systems in which you have to set up and we're not going to be able to go into those today, but systems like anything in a business can be outsourced and that's where making this thing passive or semi-passive can absolutely happen. That's why I love this business and don't do this alone. Um, whether it's education, uh, going on YouTube, uh, reaching out to someone like me, partnering with someone that has the knowledge, the experience, uh, getting a mentor, whatever you got to do, just don't do it alone. Um, or getting the manager. Okay. So how to make it passive. Let's talk about that for a second. We're running out of time here, about five minutes left. So smart b, &B and beyond pricing are phenomenal tools. I'll just give you a real brief description of these, but you'll definitely want to make a note of this. Smart b, &B is automated messaging so that you don't have to be married to your phone. So when a guest says, hey, I want to book your place, you can have an automated message that says, great. I would love to host you. Can you please do me a favor and read the house rules, confirm the house rules and know that we have a recording device on the property. If so, you're good to go and you can book anytime. Um, Airbnb sees that too. And by the way, that's part of their algorithm. They want to see that you're responding in a reasonable amount of time to your guests. And if you have an automated messaging system, well, that's great. Now you don't have to check your phone every two minutes. You can check your phone every couple hours. It's pretty awesome. Beyond pricing 
is an amazing tool that allows you to be able to use what's called dynamic pricing. Uh, it's what the hotels use. It's what airports use um, where pricing adjusts. It goes up and down and fluctuates based on supply and demand and based on timing of which a guest is going to book. So rather than you having to go and manually uh, adjust prices, you can use Beyond Pricing, a third-party company that will help dynamically price your properties and adjust based on supply, demand, and time. Pretty cool. Or you can also make it uh, passive with people. In the trades industry, cleaners, interior designers, handyman, uh, et cetera, uh, assistance in person and virtual. We have, uh, again, that's how I'm communicating with all of our guests. When smart BNB doesn't answer the question and a guest has a more specific question, a uh, virtual assistant is able to handle that question. And then if something needs to get, go, go get dropped off in person, I've got an in-person assistant that's helping out as well. Um, and, or you can hire an Airbnb property manager. So that's what I do. Um, I only do it in Fresno. So that's, or now we're going to be doing it in Phoenix as well. But um, hiring an in-person in property manager, I think in-person is better than remote. However, um, it is possible to be able to do that as well. Um, I think just things to look out for. Uh, managers take between 15 to 25% of the gross income. So is that, you know, if you're going to, call it $5,000, you're going to gross $5,000. Is it worth it to give away $1,000 of that a month to make it completely passive? And that's what we do for our um, clients. But check the references. Um, our, I know that when someone asked me, hey, if you were to manage my Airbnb, what would that look like? Do you have references? I know that my references are going to give glowing um, reviews, but are your is the person that you're looking at to have as a manager, is that person going to have glowing reviews? That's, that's very, very important. Um, so a couple opportunities here as we're getting ready to uh, get to the Q and a portion of this. I would love if you joined our absolutely free Facebook group. It's called Airbnb masterminds picture looks just like this. Um, we, it's a free group where I am posting lots of uh, value, getting lots of interaction with people. If you have, questions at all, I check it at least once a day. You can always post your question in this group and it will get answered. Or um, you can contact me directly. I would love to be able to help you out um, a few different ways. Email. Um, oh, we lost it. There we go. Um, so email is info at fearlesskyle.com. My website is fearlesskyle.com. And then if you just Google search uh, the fearless investor, uh, you'll find that we have a YouTube and podcast channel that can actually also be found on our fearlesskyle.com website as well. So um, that was a lot of information to cram into just under 30 minutes, but it looks like I've done that. And I know there's probably going to be lots of questions now. So um, I think now is the time for that. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time, Kyle. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and get the questions queued up here see what questions we have for you. So bear with me just a moment. Yeah, no problem. Um, first one says, I'm interested to hear if location of Kyle's properties are, are now or have they changed since the pandemic? Uh, I'm assuming the, it said location. Have the locations changed? Maybe locations, yeah. Have they changed since the pandemic? No, locations haven't changed at all. Um, and, and this is a really good question from a, um, a pandemic standpoint, though, is that we were not hardly affected by the pandemic. There was this oh crap moment in the beginning. And I remember it like yesterday, March 12th, when the pandemic hit and you know, the shutdown happened. And we had like 10 reservations for at the time, we only had eight properties. Um, so we went from like, basically um, we had this moment of, wow, we just had 10 cancellations. And then the next day we had 10 rebookings and it was staying pretty steady, but we were having to lower our rates a little bit. Um, I ended up just out of precaution, changing a lot of our stuff into month to month rentals, but I kept three on Airbnb. And I realized the three on Airbnb were performing amazing. So I just moved everything back over to Airbnb in May and we have everything on Airbnb again. And it's been, I mean, we just had a 100% occupancy for 20 plus properties in July, like 99% in August. And then we're on pace right now um, for October. 
I think we're going to be right around like 97%. So um, the pandemic did not affect us that much. And I think the reason for that is because we're in a market where people have to come to Fresno. They don't necessarily want to. So, you know, like a, a Tampa, Florida, or, um, you know, in Nashville or Vegas, those are places where people want to go. They want a vacation. Um, whereas with us, it's business and family is still going on during a pandemic. So um, that would definitely be uh, another thing to look at is location is the place that you're going to have. Is there going to be a lot of businesses? There's going to be a lot of family reasons just beyond vacation in case pandemic stuff continues to uh, affect things in the future. Okay. Next question, have you gotten any pushback on deed restrictions? I checked with local government and they don't consider Airbnb commercial, but a few people in the area are giving me briefs saying Airbnb is commercial business and therefore violates the deed restrictions. Uh, I would love to be able to answer that question, but I have no experience on that. Um, so I, I apologize. Um, that might be something though, that if you join our Facebook group and ask that question, there's people in there that do own a lot of properties and might be able to answer that question a little bit better, but I've, I've never had that issue. Um, I'm not sure how they can argue that that's commercial because it's short-term rentals. Um, it's still a single family residence. So unless it's uh, an apartment or something, um, no, I, I'm not sure that uh, I have the knowledge for that. I apologize. Okay. Next question says, um, what about taxes like sales tax, hospitality tax, et cetera? Uh, yeah. So every single location is different. So um, like in Fresno, we don't have a hospitality tax that the city taxes us. Uh, but in Visalia, which is 45 minutes away, there is one. Now, the great thing is Airbnb sets you up to be able to charge that to the guests so that you don't get charged that yourself. Um, but yeah, if, if for some reason um, you're going to get charged hospitality tax and you don't know about it, that's why you got to check with the city. Um, then you definitely need to be able to adjust your rates accordingly so that, you know, most hospitality taxes are like, you know, 10 to 12%. I've seen some that are as high as 14% adjust your rates to be able to, to reflect that. And if you're having experienced that, then the rest of the city is having experienced that too. So you're going to see everyone's rates go up um, rather than just your own. So the competition should stay the same. Okay. Next question. Um, how do you, Oh, how do you get Airbnb to talk to you as a landlord? Um, I can't get them to respond. I did not get paid for uh, from Airbnb for a weekend rental. I've made numerous phone calls and letters besides the Better Business Bureau. Do you have any recommendations? Wow. Um, I've never heard that happen. Um, the first thing I would do is absolutely call customer service and just work on getting to a representative. Uh, one of the things that I do is I just make sure that um, there's, there's really interesting things about Airbnb's customer service ever since the pandemic, because they let a lot of people off. Uh, they had to use virtual assistants mainly as their, uh, call center people. And so they let off uh, something around hundred to 200 virtual assistants, um, for the call center. So getting to them on the phone is a lot more difficult. However, if you get them at a certain time during the day, um, it's very easy to get there. Um, I find that middle of the day, right around four, th three to four Pacific standard time seems to be the best time to be able to reach them. Um, and then if that doesn't work, you can message them through the Airbnb app. Um, and yeah, I mean, they, they need to be responding to that. So if, if they are not responding to that, um, that's, that's really strange to me. I've never heard of someone not being able to get payment for something. Um, I get paid all the time on all of my properties. So that's very strange, but I would just continue to reach out to them um, until they respond. Do you pass on the cleaning fee to the guests? Yes, hundred percent. And we make sure we profit from it as well. Um, if I'm paying the cleaning fee, the cleaner is $70, then I'm charging the guests 90 um, as a nice way to profit or as a nice way to be able to give my cleaner some extra income every once in a while when they're doing a great job. Um, this person has been doing this, but have had challenges with HOAs changing their regulations. Also, what about short-term rental requirements by the city or county? So we already talked about city and county. Um, you just got to call them, ask them what the deal is, uh, abide by that, figure out if, I mean, if, you know, they have 30 day minimums that, that might be a more difficult thing to be able to do based on the reason for a lot of guests going there. Um, we have HOAs that we work with here in town 
in Fresno that are 30 day minimums. And so we just promote it as a 30 day minimum. Um, yes, it means that we have a little bit more vacancies, but uh, the numbers work out for us. So you got to know your numbers. That's the big thing. If you have to be 100% occupied and you're in order to make money and your HOA has a 30 day minimum, uh, that might not be the best place to do an Airbnb because if you have someone that books, call it October 1st to October 31st, and then the next person books November 14th through December 14th, well, now you have this 14 day gap from November 1st to November uh, 14th that is not being booked out. And are you going to lose money during that time? So that's, that's what you got to figure out is, um, again, most of this business is just understanding your numbers. Um, and you can find out a lot about that through using AirDNA and our profit calculator. Okay. Somebody else asked, um, beyond pricing, Airbnb has smart pricing. How do they compare? Yeah, I'll be honest. Um, I prefer smart pricing um, because I really like to be hands-on with my calendar. Um, I, I recommend beyond pricing to people who want to make this passive. However, for me, because I've made the rest of my business passive, um, I do focus my time on calendar management and pricing. It takes me about 30 minutes a day. Um, I jump on there. My smart pricing um, allows me to know that, hey, this is the minimum that it will ever be at. Um, and then I can just manually change some prices from there. If I want to try to get some higher prices or as I get closer to a vacancy, I can manually change it to uh, a lower price. So um, if you're going to do smart pricing, just make sure that you do a high number on your minimum pricing. And then uh, that will allow you to be able to make sure you're not losing money uh, through the smart pricing tool. Uh, but again, if you want to be more passive with it, I would definitely suggest beyond pricing. Um, what is Airbnb's fee for association? Uh, yeah. So as a guest, you're getting charged. It's in the neighborhood of like 10 to 12%. Um, so if I'm booking a place for a thousand dollars, I'm probably going to be paying in fees another hundred to $200 uh, to Airbnb. But me, if I'm making a thousand dollars, I'm only char I'm only uh, sending to Airbnb $30. So they're just charging me 3%. So um, really, really great uh, from the host standpoint for sure. What is a typical vacancy rate? Um, in the example you provided, it didn't seem to have a vacancy. So um, can you elaborate? Um, so again, you have to, you can't, you can't ask a general question like that and assume it's going to be like that over the entire span of the U S uh, air DNA is going to be your best bet for that. You'll see that in Fresno, California, the average occupancy is 79 to 80% which of course means there's a vacancy of 20 to 21%, just do the difference there. Um, and, but, but my occupancy is 95 to 97% year round. So I outperform my market by 15% without sacrificing value because the average rate in Fresno, again, is somewhere around like 108 to 110, but I'm averaging 122 per night. So uh, the value of that, of knowing that is, within air DNA uh, versus like a Phoenix, Arizona, you know, 60 to 65% is the occupancy, which of course means 35 to 40% vacancy. Um, but if you, if you set up your systems correctly and how you're making your listing, how you're promoting it, what value you're giving to the guests, you got to realize, you know, just like anything, averages take the best and they take the worst. And so if you average that out, are you going to be in the middle or are you going to be up towards the best? And if you are doing it the right way, you should be up towards the best, which means, hey, if, if, if I'm seeing that Phoenix is 60%, well, that means that some people are probably like 40% and some people are probably 80%. So I got to do everything in my power to learn how I can get up to that 80% and be one of the best in Phoenix. Um, next question. When using a mortgage to purchase a rental property, I've had to supply the bank a copy of an executive, executed lease agreement to prove the rental income. Have you had to supply any proof of potential rental income on getting a loan for the purchase of a new property? Um, I, I've only had to do that on refinances. Um, I haven't had to do that on actual purchasing properties. Um, not sure if that's just a California thing or what, but no, I have not had to do that. Um, so just refinances. Okay. Have you had a property fail at Airbnb? No. How do you handle it when someone breaks your house rules and then leaves you a bad review to try to cover themselves? 
Yeah, and this kind of goes back to the difficulty with uh, Airbnb customer support right now. So I do want to be 100% transparent on this. Um, we just do the best job at pre-screening guests so we don't have issues, but things fall through the cracks. People steal things every once in a while. People damage things. Towels get stained. Um, a lamp falls down and it breaks. Stuff happens. Um, it happens a lot less than it used to happen. In 2019, uh, with just five or six properties, we probably did about 40 different claims. Now here in 2020, with over 20 properties, we probably in total this year have done 20 claims. So we do a much better job of pre-screening guests now, um, which is great because Airbnb has kind of started to slack on following through on their Airbnb uh, host guarantee. A host guarantee used to be the most magical thing that I saw possible, which was, hey, um, these guests left the place a mess. I had to pay my cleaning crew an extra $200. Here's the receipt. Within three days, Airbnb would reimburse me. Now they do a lot more of strict timelines of which you have to do that. Um, they ask for a lot more pictures, they ask for a lot more proof. And then it feels like you have to kind of hound them a little bit and follow up with them. Hey, I haven't been reimbursed, haven't been reimbursed. And before you know, it's three or four weeks and they're finally reimbursing you. So um, the biggest thing I would say is pre-screening those guests. Another way you can do it, Airbnb has given you the opportunity to add a security deposit for those stays. So if the guest is going to stay and it's going to cost them $2,000, you can ask for a $500 security deposit. And then basically you can release that security deposit after they have left. Um, but that's a, that is a great added feature if you are worried about things like that. Um, just keep in mind if you do that, as a guest, I'm a little bit more resistant to booking a place with a security deposit because I don't know you. I don't necessarily trust you. Maybe you have great reviews, but I still don't know if I'm going to get my security deposit back or not. So um, there's, some, there's some pros and cons, but I think the biggest thing here, guys, to know is like, once you do this, you're going you're gonna to learn what the best system is for your area. Um, and so finding out, like for me in Fresno, I don't do a security deposit and most people don't in Fresno, but in a, maybe a more vacation-y spot with more chance for parties, um, there's probably everyone is doing a security deposit. So knowing your competition and what they're doing too is really important. Um, how do you handle when renters book with dogs and don't pay the deposits? There's not a place on the site where renters know where to put your dog deposits. Um, yeah, I've never had an issue with people paying the dog deposit. Um, we just collect it through Venmo or Cash App. Um, you can actually request money to the guests, but the requesting money from the guests, you can't actually do that until um, the reservation starts. That's why we use the other forms of payment. So that way, if a guest books a week from today and we tell them, hey, it's a $75 pet deposit, Here's our Venmo information or here's our cash app information. Well, leading up to the day of, if they haven't paid for it, I'm calling Airbnb and saying, hey, this guest hasn't paid um, you know, an agreed upon pet deposit. We need to cancel this without any sort of, um, without any sort of penalty. And most of the time, you know, as long as they check out the messages and see, then they're going to abide by that. Um, so that would be my recommendation is just try to get it right away um, as soon as they book. Don't wait until they show up to the, uh, the reservation. Do you have a minimum stay at your Airbnbs? Yeah, I, I do. Um, I didn't used to, but again, that's been part of the reason why we have had less issues. So what I would suggest is at least a three-day minimum um, to try and mitigate your risk of people coming in and partying. Um, and then keep in mind too, uh, you know, if you really like profiting from the cleaning fees, you might want to have a maximum fee, uh, maximum stay as well. Uh, but for us, we love the long-term stays. We don't discount the long-term stays uh, because we get them booked a lot. Um, and it's a lot less turnover, a lot less headaches. Um, but yeah, the, the minimum stays give us more, uh, more opportunity to be able to not have to worry about the turnovers or the problems that would come with like a one night stay. Okay. Two last questions because we're getting short on time. Um, yep. The first one, how do you pre-screen your guests? Okay. Um, those questions. So, yeah, that is an entire teaching point that I wish I could go into um, in less than 30 seconds, but I can't. The best way I can say is if you add the ring doorbell and you make sure that the guests confirm that they have read the house rules and understand that there is a recording device on the front of the property, 
then that should get rid of 95 ish percent of your issues. Um, that's the best pre-screening because think about it. If people are coming in to have a party um, and they know that you're monitoring that. Um, then they're just probably going to look elsewhere. They're probably going to try to book with someone else. Um, that's the best way I could go a lot more into that, but um, I would definitely say as well, turn your instant book on, but there's a requirement that you can have of which uh, the guest has to have a good review from another host in order for them to actually instantly book. Okay. And then lastly, do you prefer vacation locations or business travel locations to invest in buying for Airbnb? Well, I don't have any in vacation areas, uh, but there's a reason for that. And I, I like, uh, I really, really like the predictability of the income of which I can get in a, um, again, a, a a necessity type of market, not a vacation type of market. So the business, the family, travelers, those kinds of things. Um, I know very consistently, and you can look at this on Air DNA as well. Uh, rental demand and seasonality is something you want to look at. Uh, having a rental demand of 80 or higher, and then a seasonality right around matching about the same means that you're going to have a lot of people that need to stay there throughout the entire year. And so if I go to like a, a call it Newport beach um, or maybe even like a salt lakes, uh, not Salt Lake city, um, park city, Utah. Yeah. I'm going to make a ton of money there, but I'm going to have maybe some months where I actually lose money. And so for that reason, I want to be able to know in like a place where Fresno is, I can, I'm, I know that like the least I'm going to make in a month on a property is $800. And the most I'm going to make is like 1200 um, get on like a two bedroom or three bedroom. So there's not much of a flex, uh, fluctuation there. I know what I'm making. So um, it just depends on your risk management and, uh, and how your, your mind operates. If you like that high and low and knowing you're going to make more, but you got to go through the low seasons, go for the vacation spots. If you like stability, go for the, the business and family spots. Okay. Well, thank you again for your time, Kyle. Appreciate it. Um, you, you have some more questions. If they want, they can reach out directly to you if it's related to self-direction or how to do this in your retirement account. We'd love to have a conversation with you. You can reach us at the number there on the screen. Um, you, can, uh, you can also text us or you can visit us at newviewtrust.com. So everyone have a wonderful day and thanks again, Kyle. Thank you. Bye.